You just found the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. This is Mind Pump. All right, you ready for this? Andrew, zoom in on me a little bit. Come on in. I'm going to tell you guys something really cool. We got, a, we got an amazing giveaway for you today. Look what we're going to give you. This is Ned Mello. This stuff will chill you out, give you the best sleep of your entire life, and you can win this for free. There's an ingredient in here that was invented by MIT. It's advanced stuff, really good stuff. Here's how you win this box, okay? Here's what I want you to do. You can zoom out now, Andrew. Uh, leave a comment um, underneath this video in the next 24 hours. So as soon as we drop this, leave one in 24 hours. If we pick your comment, if Doug looks at your comment and says, this is the best one out of all of them, then we're going to mail this right to your door, and then you'll get to chill out. And let me tell you, it's fun to chill out with Mellow. Also, subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. We give stuff away all the time. You're going to want to get on the podcast when we drop them. Otherwise, you don't win anything. Okay, so you want to win something? Turn on those notifications. One more thing. Uh, check out our free guides at mindpumpfree.com. I lied. I got one more thing to tell you. We got three things on sale before we start the podcast. Maps Hit, Map Split, and the Bikini Bundle. Go check them out. 50% off. Go to my, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code spring break. All right. Enjoy the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you remember? So uh, opener, closer, and middle, re between middle relief, the penis he, between us. Yes. The penis between us. That makes mm, us the, the most important parts. Mm. We're the, the Franks and Hold on. What's, what's Doug then? He's the- He's um, the bunch? He, yeah. <laughs> Definitely, the definitely bunch. the bunch. You're the the, the bunch. Doug. Yeah, you know what a bunch it's is. Important. Doug? I don't think Doug knows what the bunch is. I don't know. Is that like the um, taint? Is that the same? That's it. Wow. Very good, Doug. Yeah. I got to know my jargon here. Doug right? knows a lot. Right. You know, and hey, I used to Andrew, leave this out of the conversation. Oh, come, <laughs> on. come on, no, come on, Andrew. Andrew, look at me right now. No, <laughs> you no, leave this in. No, that was. Uh, I remember. I used to. Uh, hey, uh, shout out to Andrew, by the way. The yeah, man, the man behind the uh, the YouTube channel. So those of you that are watching this, um, he is the one. So make sure you give him some love on there. He's the one that puts all the cuts and edits and makes the show a little more entertaining than just our stupid faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We got stupid faces, I mean, all right. <laughs> we try. You remember when you were a kid? Songs that you you listened to that were like uh, risky or controversial do you guys remember that when you were real young yeah because i was one i have one song i want to sex you up. really was that a big deal for you well that was like in sixth grade i yeah. mean that's like inappropriate <laughs> wait, wait, wait hold on who was that again that was uh, uh color me bad yeah yeah yeah. oh my god i remember that, that was dude. mainstream yeah they were really good mm. looks like adam's having technical difficulties yeah. again uh, no no this is on okay. yeah. yeah yeah it's not Help that it's not it's I mean, a, literally, I, I just heard it go dead. It might be a connection down there. Yeah, because I can hear you good, Adam. It's on. It may not still have enough power. Oh, okay. mm. Mm. There we go. Let's see. We got to fix it again. Hey, fuck off. Just wait. Here. Science <laughs> and technology. Most, Im most important guy coming in. Hello. It's fun. You'll oh, see. Hello. Here he is. There you go. Uh, yeah. Downloads yeah. are back up. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Almost when I lost that watch time. When I was hey. a kid, you know what song was uh, a big deal? That I remember my parents were like, turn that off. Two, two live crew. No. Oh, cool. Obviously. I'm talking yes. about songs that were like not so super obvious. Can Candyman knocking boots. That I got was, I got in uh, trouble for that one. Did you? Yeah, really? my parents uh, ripped the tape out. You know what's funny was that wow. that happened to me. I think what I, I don't maybe Doug could check the date on Candyman knocking boots when that when that was released. So I was I was pretty young. I was in the Modesto. That was house. like ninety. So I had a, I want to say I was like fourth grade ish, somewhere around there. And uh, yeah, got in big trouble. You were I, 16 years old in fourth grade, right? <laughs> yeah, something like How that. How many times you skipped yeah, that? Yeah, right. yeah. No, so I, I remember my parents grounding me, taking that, like I was in big trouble over that, uh, feeling like, oh my God, that was so bad. And, I, and years, way later, way later, I remember going back and being like, oh my God, that song, Candyman. Let me, and I listened to it, I'm like, oh my God. It's like not bad at all. No, dude. It's just man. because the song is- Inferring. Uh, yeah, inferring that they are- Wow, 1990. Yeah, yeah. Wow, look at that, 90. huh? Ninety. That's a yeah. good year. Yeah. I uh, for me it was uh, I don't remember the name of the person either. It was um, I touch myself. <laughs> you guys remember that song? <laughs> yes. Yeah, when I, I think about you, yeah. I, I touch myself. Oh, yeah, and I was listening. I did you get in trouble for that? Anybody else? Well, yeah, I mean, oh, no. how do you know that? I, you know, because the song made me full of worthless information. You don't remember here, that dude. song? Not like that. Really? Well, I know all the lyrics. Yeah. I'm sure Justin he had that song. I'm sure you had a poster of it. This is how Justin figured it out. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, touch myself. <laughs> let me, and then what? Let me give this a <laughs> shot. Then what? Then you We're, take off your pants. No, they don't say that. Diddle around. Oh, no. 
<laughs> something like that. And, and the, just like taking notes. And the video was kind of weird. Like the girl wasn't that, she wasn't really that hot. But when I figured out what she was talking Does about. Does anybody know who it is? Do you know who, who the. Doug, look it up. Look up. No, uh, see, that's, that's, I touch myself song. That's where my memory <laughs> and, stops. And when, yeah, what year is it? Too? And then click on images. No, don't do that. Just click on. Uh, yeah. I t- oh, there. The, uh, the vinyls. Is that like a one hit wonder? Never, yeah, never. Yeah. Her, dude. Look at her. I remember her bangs were so long, I couldn't see her eyeballs. Yeah. See that right there? She's banging. She's. Uh, what, what year? Open up the lyrics there, Doug. Let's look at the lyrics real quick. Let's, yeah. let's read I love this. myself. I it says, my... I love myself. I want you to love me. When mm. I feel down, I want you above me. Oh, wow. I search myself. I want you to find me. I forget myself. I want you to remind me. This is yeah. poetic. I don't want anybody else. When I think about you, I touch myself. I mean, myself. it's no wet ass pussy, but yeah. <laughs> it tries. Songs, <laughs> songs have come a long Soft. way. Soft. Yeah. Actually, actually, it's not true. If you listen to some of the music of the 70s, whoa, whoa. There was a song called Cocaine. Oh, that's yeah. the title of the song. By Cream? Uh, I think that's it, yeah. right? Yeah. Cocaine. Yeah. As a parent, what would you be more nervous about your kids hearing? Be honest. Think about that right now. Like, like what song? Yeah, like, okay, a song that's talking all about doing cocaine or a song all about wet-ass pussy. Ooh. Oh, well, it's I, kind I mean, of a toss up. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, okay, yeah, you, you have probably cocaine. Well, I mean, that would be worse. Alarmed by I mean, both. I mean, really, I'm, with your stance on drugs, you think that that would be worse? Well, I mean, what would you rather have your kid like dabble in? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh my God. <laughs> it's gonna influence him. <laughs> He's for sure you dabbling your, in one of those. Yeah, you want your kid like, it. yeah, Dad. I, I, I don't worry. I just I hit the song "Cocaine," so I'm just doing some lines. I want to. Test it out. Uh, or you want your son to come home and be like, "Test it out, Dad." I was uh, I heard the the wet Dab- ass pussy dabbling, song. Dabbling in some so wet. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was dabbling yeah, in some. I think I'm going in the the second option. Yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying. Uh, well, that's a good point. It's a valid yeah, point. I hadn't yeah. thought of that. I hadn't thought that far. Oh, so <laughs> wow, so many things you got to consider as a parent. Yeah. yeah. Well, now. Because because of the internet, forget about it, dude. At least there was at least some semblance of control, you know, that our parents had. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the dirty movies were scrambled. You couldn't get, you couldn't really watch them. Um, if you wanted to listen to something crazy, it wasn't on the radio. Yeah. Or if it was, it was censored. You had to go buy it. Mm-hmm. But now it's just a couple clicks of the mouse, and you know, yeah, I know. You can see all kinds yeah, of stuff. You think you can set up all these firewalls, dude? They know their way around it. <laughs> totally. Every now, time. You know, there, I know, there's a lot of like alarmists around around that idea, right? That it's so easy access for kids. But there's some positives to that, don't you think too? It's kind of like what we brought up the other day about the whole drinking age. Like some countries that there is no drinking age, so it's not a big deal to drink mm. alcohol. Because it's so easy to have access to nudity and, and pornography and stuff like that. So it's like responsible cocaine use <laughs> versus coke crazy. Not coke. I'm talking about the nudity. Yeah, no, I think you're. I think you're. You're. I think there's definitely some a point. Yeah, yeah I, I Jin alluded to that, right? The book I Jin talks about that it's not all all negative, you know. And and I think you've brought this up, which these stats are inside that book too. You know, kids are waiting longer to experiment with drugs. Mm-hmm. Kids are waiting longer to have sex, to get mm-hmm. married, to drive cars, all things that could be considered risky, right? Mm-hmm. So I know, like my son, dude, yeah. he's, he's 15, right? He'll turn 16 this summer, and he's he's going to do this permit test online, and he's just dragging his ass, like just waiting. And I'm like, what are you doing? Man, when I was 16, I was like, I want to be ready the yeah. day I turn 16. Get me out of here. Get my, yeah, it was like, your way to get out of the house and like actually hang yeah. out with your friends. I think, too, that's the other thing. It's like you can hang out with your friends just by chatting virtually. Well, now. not just that, too. Uber. Yeah, that, too. Uber is so easy. I yeah, mean, it, Uber Uber is so easy and inexpensive. So mm-hmm. if, if you're a kid who would end up having to pay for his car and pay for his uh, insurance. Actually, that's not bad. Yeah, yeah, think about that. If you're a kid, like I mean, it, the family I grew up in, I would have to pay for these things, right? So they weren't going to yeah, insurance, were, gas, car. Yeah, that's expensive. Mm-hmm. You know, even a, a even a clunker is going to cost you a few hundred bucks at least a month. With you just pay ten bucks to get a ride here. Or there. That's right. You would have mm-hmm. to do a lot of rides with Uber to to actually justify. And I think did, that's. Did these, you guys ever hitchhike? Back in the day. Oh wow! Yeah, because like I did one. Think time, about that now. I mean, you have Uber. Like, who's hitchhiking anymore? Nobody. Is. Nobody. Well, you know that was a big deal back in the day, right? Uh-huh. Before when, when before we were kids, when like yeah, like serial killers, like murder. Well, so okay, so you want to hear a failed? You want to hear a failed uh, toy idea? Yeah. So I, there was definitely a, there was a, I can't wait to hear you tie this to hitchhikers. Oh yeah, no, there was a tie, there was a um uh, back in I think it was in the sixties. I don't know the name of this toy. But it was a toy that you you put an address on it or something like that and a note inside. And you, I don't know how it worked. You left it on the road or whatever. And the idea was that cars 
would drive by, pick it up, and hitchhike it down, and then you'd get this, and this was like this fun game. What? And then parents were like, wait a minute, it's got my kid's name on it and their address, and some random person could pick it up and find us. What? This was yeah. a real thing? This yeah, was a toy I mean, idea that was one of those big flops, that, you know, uh, this, this famous thank flops. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know the name of it, but this was a real thing. Hey, Google that, Doug. What are the, what are the most uh, failed toys? Look up toys? Hitchhiker, <laughs> Hitchhiker failed toy. I want to see failed like toys in general. What are some like flop toys that were no good? <laughs> <laughs> They're probably all the phallic toys. No, you know, you know what? It, it's always... <laughs> No, it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> this <laughs> carrot doesn't look like a carrot. <laughs> yeah, it's not those things. It's, uh, a, it's you the can ones go that play are, hide the carrot. It's the ones yeah. that are dangerous that <laughs> you don't, that you don't think kids. like what a kid would do with it, right? It's always that's the fi- normally the failed yeah, ones, right? right? Or like the practice toy. operating on your friends. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. No, that's not it. Wait, Cabbage Patch Snack Time Kids. <laughs> that's a wait, yeah. airport security place. <laughs> 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 Burger King Pokemon container. These are all newer ones. You got to look up the one. Hey, speaking of Burger King, did you guys see the uh, the news around them with the apology? Yes. The no. tweet they did? I thought uh-uh. that what they did was smart. Uh, brilliant. So I saw our buddy Connor, right, who talks all well, mostly political stuff, and he was bringing this up and mm-hmm. like was talking about it. To me, it's very – okay, Burger King, by the way, I love Burger King abs. Burger King is brilliant, They they're then they're smart on social media if you mm-hmm. watch them. Them, Wendy's uh, – they, uh, McDonald's isn't quite there yet. Yeah. There's these... weren't they the ones that were going to plan on delivering to people in traffic at one point? Uh, was that them that Man, they I brought that up a long time? Yeah, a long ago. time ago. Anyway, so they they're already like ahead of the curve mm-hmm. in their con- compared to their peers with social media, and we know how things are going right now with like everybody is so quick to jump all over, and for them to come out and tweet something like women should stay in the kitchen. Like oh, no, it said women belong in the kitchen. Yeah, women belong in the kitchen. Now, now here's why they said that, and it, I think it was brilliant. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm, you, sorry, I'm trying to take this in right yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> that just happened. Yeah. You, <laughs> come on. You cannot tell me Burger King is worth you know billions of dollars. It does not have a, a brilliant marketing well, team so that here's knows what, that. Here's what it was. It was that the <sighs> the uh, chefs and and uh, high level cooks, it's dominated by men, and what they were saying is essentially they're trying to promote. We need to come out with programs. That's to not what. That's not what they were doing, though. That was their brilliant spin. That was the, on that, how to how to cover their ass yes. when people came after them. Yes. No, brilliant. It was absolutely yeah. brilliant marketing. <laughs> I love that though. Yeah. Like yeah. way to play with this. Like they're the, like, yeah. Oh, what? Yeah. All confused. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm angry. Yeah. I'm angry. And Wait, I'm sad, but but I'm, it's for a good thing. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. I'm not mad anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I really want a Whopper. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I'm hungry now. <laughs> so that's yeah. exactly what yeah. happened. You know what? I'm so angry. Yeah. I've used so much energy being angry, and now I'm like, it's okay, so I'm hungry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, when I get real mad, I just want food. <laughs> go get a, go get, some, get a Whopper. Uh, I haven't had a Whopper. Wow, what a spin on that. No, it's it's smart, right? Yeah. Very smart. Yeah. Right? Very, very smart. Yeah. Are you guys uh, Whopper or Big Mac? Big Mac. Really? Yeah. It's a bread sandwich. It doesn't matter. It's that special Thousand Island sauce that's so special. You and you and special sauces. I swear to yeah. God, <laughs> it's it's just got a lot of bread in it, and it's, it's it, it, the Whopper is just meaty. It's got more stuff. The double Whopper is more meaty. Yeah, but not the regular talk, Whopper. Dude, it's all about Carl's Jr. Dude, we guys. Well, yeah, I didn't even say that. Honestly, <laughs> all the Western them. bacon cheese. Hello, all of them suck. I tried to have one not that long ago. It was I don't know a few months diarrhea right away. Yo, yeah, just right through me. I can't even enjoy it, man. Yeah. I mean, it's like yeah, I'm halfway. Yeah, I haven't through, had one in years. Halfway through the burger. I'm, always, I'm already in the bathroom. Do you know what my son said? That I think I brought this up already on the podcast a while ago that I thought was brilliant. So we don't eat a lot of traditional fast food. We just don't. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, we would buy McDonald's here and there, burger, especially when I work with my dad. For lunch, it was like a treat because I was working with him and helping him. That's how he would pay me. He'd buy me lunch. Looking back, I'm like, nice, dad. Thanks. Yeah. But anyway, my, my kids really, they've had McDonald's maybe twice in their life. I don't think they've ever had Burger King. I, they've never had Carl's Jr. They've never had Jack in the Box. They've never had uh, Taco Bell, like all these. So my son goes, you know what I want to do? He goes, I want to go on a fast food tour with you. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I, he goes I've never tried all of these, these very popular fast food places, Dairy Queen and Burger King and uh, Sonic. He goes, I, I think it would be fun if, if you and I went you know, and did this for like a week or two where we went to one each time and tried different things. How uh, kind of fun, right? Yeah, yeah I don't yeah. know, dude. You buy them. I don't know, little, I don't know how smart that little is. Little merchandise while you're there, you know, little yeah. little plastic toys. Yeah. 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 How, how did you get diabetes? Well, my dad took me on a tour. <laughs> yeah, I know. Of all the fast food, you know what's like, gonna happen, dude. My he's trainer like, dad. He's took a kid, me. bro, and he's got an iron gut at this age right now. He's gonna go through and be like, "What the hell? You've been holding yeah. this back this whole I time." Know. 
You get addicted to it, man. Yeah, no. yeah. Spicy chicken sandwiches. You may as well oh. take them on a tour of Snorting Lion. Not, whoa. 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 It's not that far. <laughs> not that far. Yeah, dude. Oh, man. Dude, I am knackered right now. Dude, that workout destroyed me. I'm really enjoying these training sessions with you guys, I tell you. But that one killed me. You were trying your best to, to get your legs sore. Today. It's it, it's 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 hurting. I'm sitting here sweating and shaking at the same time. I feel like something's wrong with me. Uh, you said you only did 12 sets, but it sure looked like a lot more to me. No, I did. I did just. I don't know how people do. When people say they do 20 legit sets for legs in one workout, are they really? Or yeah, is it yeah. like 10 sets of leg extensions? I was going to say eight of those have got to be leg extensions and leg curls on a machine. Yeah. Because if I, because I can do it that way. Cause yeah. Because you could easily do that after what you just did. Yeah. I don't think they're doing like a bunch of compound lifts because there's no way. It's just insane. Speaking of which, of working out, remember how I brought up that study on hip thrusts Oh, and yeah. I meant to ask you about that. I saw in our forum somebody was trying to poo-poo it. Yes. So there's, there's some controversy around, I guess, the group that did that study. Apparently... That group is being criticized because a lot of the data that comes out from them uh, on their studies is uh, improbable in the sense that, and I tried to read the breakdown and it's a lot of study jargon or whatever, but apparently a, a lot of the other metrics in there are so improbable that they're like, we don't think that they're reporting accurately or that they're fudging their numbers. This doesn't seem like a study. And I guess it's happened a few times. So there's a few people that are debating the squat versus hip thrust study. And for the people who don't know, this was a previous episode, uh, squats built in this study twice as much muscle in the butt as hip thrusts and six times more muscle in the quads than the hip thrust, which that, that part was uh, ex ex expected. But the glute one, mm -hmm. that, there's a bit of a debate. But I do find it funny how it's such a debate. Well, I don't, I, I don't understand why it's, it actually isn't that obvious. I mean, we, we, we alluded to it in the last time we discussed it, like the range of motion that you're getting in a squat yes. versus the range of motion on a hip thrust. And you really could load, I mean, you can load a hip thrust a lot, a lot, right? And probably a lot, most people can. Yeah, but you could also load a leg press a lot. Yeah. And it, but it doesn't yeah, but necessarily it's not as mean demanding. Right. You, you know, you feel that going through the exercise. Like, even though you load it like crazy, it's just really not yeah. as demanding. The, as the hip thrust is superior in that, that fully contracted position. But aside from that, the range of motion is, is tiny. Whereas with a squat from bottom all the way almost to top, once I'm sure at top you could relax your glutes, but from the bottom all the way up, that's a lot of range of motion to move the weight. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to, and again, I'll, I'll stand by that. In my experience, for mo unless you have a poor connection to your glutes, in which case I'd say hip thrusts are probably better, uh, squats. Well, the other thing that I find interesting about studies like this too is that squats have been around for a really long time and popular. Hip thrusts have not. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you you get a group of like forty people and you you get them both doing both these movements. But oh, I see the point you're going. With. Yeah, but you have somebody who you know for the last five years they've squatted on and off or consistently maybe, and then you introduce hip thrusts in there, and of of course you would see a huge change, just like yeah. you would with any other a different stimulus. Absolutely, just like you would see with somebody who's never done Bulgarian split squats. I remember the first time that I got into like split squats. I avoided oh, yeah. those like the plague forever. My legs blew up from that. That's now, do a good I, point. Do I think Bulgarian split squats are superior necessarily to a squat? Well, no. Maybe if I had done Bulgarian split squats and never mm. done a barbell back squat, I would have seen the reverse. To stabilize happen. the joint, you can make an argument that's superior, but yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's a great point because if you do a study and you're having the people do an exercise that they've been doing for a while and you compare it to an exercise that they've not done uh, very often or ever or ever, that new stimulus is going to produce uh, probably some unex what, maybe unpredictable or or gains that you wouldn't normally see if the exercise was already done consistently. You get those newbie gains, kind of right, yeah. For, especially on a great movement. Yeah. It is a great movement, mm -hmm. right? So if you if you've neglected, I mean, you guys have to remember this in your training career. Every time totally. you, you introduced a great movement that you had never really done, like the gains yeah. probably came on like nothing else before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's one of those things you get hyped on as a trainer. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, all your clients are doing this like yeah. crazy. And that's all you're doing, you know? <laughs> and then it just, and then you run across something else. That like, has to be the biggest, most common mistake that trainers make yeah. is that they train their clients like they train themselves. Like, oh, this works really good for me. Oh, we all do it. Yeah. You're all going to do the same thing. We're all doing <laughs> singles on squats yeah. today. This Everybody's going to feel it. You guys are gonna love this. Yes. Like, I, don't, I don't like it. Yeah. Now, speaking of training, I got another interesting study that just came out, and this one supports a couple other studies. So, in the past, when they've done studies on anabolic steroids uh, or testosterone use, right? So, uh, exogenous testosterone use, meaning men injecting testosterone into their into their bodies. 
What they found is that men who will take testosterone and then go off, obviously their natural testosterone is suppressed. But then after a certain period of time, <coughs> what they would say is it'll go back up uh, to normal. Well, there's been a couple studies now that show that even short-term anabolic steroid use or an especially long-term anabolic steroid use causes long-lasting and maybe permanent changes to the testosterone-producing cells in the testicles. So men in their 20s who use testosterone more li- are, are, are quite likely to uh, have much lower testosterone in their 40s and 50s because of the of the steroid use in their twenties. Well, that may I mean that's mm. pretty logical. Now, was this? Did you go down this rabbit hole because of the response to the John Romano uh, recommendation for a young guy? No, no. But somebody <clears throat> sent it to me because of that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You started reading because because I know that. Uh, I feel like it's a, if that's a path you're going to go down, then right. you, you you need to make you need to be okay with the fact that you probably are going to need to end up on TRT uh, when you get older. Well, especially at those levels that he suggested. I mean, I thought that was that was the maybe the most yeah, it sounded really high to me. And interesting. I don't know yeah, much. I mean, I made the mistake of being that high. I uh, mean, according to him, it wouldn't be that much of a mistake. It would yeah. have been the, the route that he would recommend. I, I just, I find that fascinating. Yeah, I could, I see his angle. His angle essentially is if you're that, if you're young and you want to see real gains, you probably need to take, you need to take a lot versus when you're older and you want to see gains. So I can no get matter that. what, taking it synthetically like that mm-hmm. is going it's to gonna replace what you're making. Yeah, it's going to no matter you take a little dose or a massive dose, uh, it's mm. going to suppress your natural hormones. And so, somebody who's young in their twenties that could They're potentially naturally high, yeah, it could be nine hundred, a thousand, yeah. right? As far as free test, mm-hmm. and then you know, that that shuts down because they're taking two hundred fifty milligrams. Two hundred fifty milligrams doesn't take them up very high, or doesn't make them feel mm. that much different than what their thousand naturally did. So from that, I get that 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 yeah. point. Mm-hmm. It is interesting to me. Um, and again, again, this is something I'll, I'll, I'll stress. If you're thinking about using uh, exogenous testosterone or anabolic steroids, you need, probably need to make peace with the fact that you might need, you're probably going to need to be on uh, TRT um, as you get older. And these studies are kind of confirming that. And that brings me to another point. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, know, you know, female hormones aren't nearly regulated like male hormones, and I'm talking about birth control, right? It's all those are all derived off of the female hormones that tell the woman that she's pregnant or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, women go on birth control for years. Yeah, you know, when they're 16, and they won't go off until they're you know 30, maybe when they're about to have uh, you know get pregnant or whatever. Um, that's got to have some long term effects too. Oh yeah, hundred percent. You know, it's going to affect your own uh, hormone production later. And I think we've been promoting it as it's no, 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 it's not a big deal. Right. But I, I'm sure it's going to have issues. You know, no. or cause issues. No. Yeah. Long-term. Just throw you out of balance, and then it's you know at that point you're you're trying to look at what other options you can do to raise other levels of different hormones in your body just to to bring it back to some semblance of, of balance. Yeah. I mean, you start you start getting your body to to stop its own production of hormones. For a while, you're probably yeah. going to pay the price for that uh, later on. I think is the, the point. Yeah, you got to consider that for sure. Hey, I wanted to uh, I wanted to do a giveaway for the the YouTube channel for uh, the Ned because you got me to take the. Oh yeah, how do you what do you think about the I, mellow? I was blown away actually. So I, and uh, dude, it, it sounded like such a sleeper product. You know, like initially when they're pitching it to us, it was like, it's, oh, interesting. It's magnesium GABA theanine. Nothing like well, here's, magical. Here's yeah. what it is, though. So that's what I thought when I saw the ingredients. I wasn't that excited initially because I'm like, okay, magnesium. I've taken magnesium before. GABA that's been around for a while. Theanine. I, I've you know I've been touting them for a while, but it's amino acid. But here's the big difference. There's one form of magnesium in the in mellow called magnesium threonate. So I think it's called threonate, T-H-R-E-O-N-A-T-E or something like that. I'm getting there uh, close. This is a form of magnesium that was actually invented by MIT. Hmm. And they created this form of magnesium because it's the only form of magnesium to cross uh, the blood-brain barrier. So here's the issue with supplementing with magnesium, absorption. Mm-hmm. So like you guys know that supplement uh, that people take, it, it, they'll, they'll mix it in their water and it fizzes. I think it's one of them's called Calm or whatever. You're very poorly absorbed. It's actually more of a laxative than anything. You take it and you'll, it'll help you as a laxative, but you're not going to absorb much magnesium. Well, with Mellow, the forms of magnesium they use in there are the ones that you really absorb. Huh. So I, not knowing this, saw it and I'm like, whatever, and didn't use it at all. We got on the phone with them. They explained <laughs> it. I looked it up, yeah. saw the MIT write up on it. I'm like, let me give this a shot. And it, I, I it relaxed me and I slept so calmly and so good and so mm-hmm. you had the same experience. So I, the way I tested it, which I I thought like on a normal night would be uh, less impactful, right, or harder for me to gauge. 
So once or twice a week, I get up as early as five o'clock, which is early for me because I normally don't get up at five o'clock in the morning. And that's hard because I don't normally go to bed before 10, 30, 11. So getting up that early is rough and I'm not a morning guy as it is. So I was like, okay, I got to go to bed by 9, 930, which is like so hard for me to settle down and then go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, this would be perfect. Let me try this out. You were just talking about it like literally a day or two before and then I had to get up really early. I took that, like I got, I literally got it. I took it in a, a um, you know, little, you know, little crystal geyser bottle, half of it full yeah, of water. Yeah, it tastes good. It's got flavor to it. <clears throat> yeah. The, the one I tried, I know they have a naked one, which is flavorless. Mm -hmm. And then they have, I think it's like a blueberry type of flavor or whatever, or blue ravend lavender, I think is what it's called. And I shook it up in about half of that uh, and, and then drank it just as I was climbing in bed. And less than 30 minutes later, I was out. And I was out hard because I woke up at one thinking it was time for me to get up. And, and you I felt refreshed. So refreshed. Like you're done. Like, I'm done sleeping. Yes, yeah. dude. I really was. Dude, this is no bullshit. It was really, it was, I was like, whoa. No, no, this is no bullshit. If you, if you look up the studies on magnesium threonate, which is, that's, the, I think the, 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 there's all of them working together, right? But that particular uh, ingredient is fascinating. Reduces depression. Studies show it reduces depression. Age-related uh, cognitive decline. Hmm. It's actually shown uh, efficacy in that. So they're now, they're now looking at giving it to people with Alzheimer's, dementia. Wow. Because um, it can cross that blood-brain barrier. Right? Yes. And, and here's the yeah, thing with magnesium. The more stressed you are, the lack of sleep, stress, work, workouts, depletes the shit of, of magnesium out of your body. Hmm. So, and again, this is one of those supplements. I was like, whatever. Well, they tried it. 80% of people are, are deficient. Right? Yes. Yeah. It's like vitamin D. It's like one of those things that we're all just deficient in. I tell you, the, the last two companies that we've picked up, both uh, LMNT and then this one, are two things I would not. I mean, we've been working with Ned before, and mm -hmm. I mean, I would stand behind their sleep product and their, their hemp oil for sure. And that's why we originally signed with them. But like you, I, was, I wasn't excited about the product when they mm -hmm. first pitched. I know like, they whatever. were. Yeah, I was kind of like, eh, yeah, it's not like, it's not a, I don't think it'll be a game changer or whatever. So I didn't think nothing of it. Same thing with the sodium, dude. Those two things, it, every time I use it, I continue to get blown away by how I feel from yeah, it. I can't mm -hmm. wait for you to try it, Justin. <clears throat> yeah. Because I know you're like, you're Mr. Impossible to, to uh, impress with supplements. I know. I'm such a dick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing works. I just I don't know. Like I, I don't like uh, throwing interventions in there. Like is but like their sleep product. Like before that, you know, with yeah. the the mellow, I haven't tried yet. But the sleep product. Like I've actually brought it down. Like my dosage. Like I've brought it down. Like I've been trying to like not use it enough because it works so good. And and so I've I've got it down to I barely even take like a couple drops mm -hmm. of it, and I get the same effect now. Wow. So it's pretty cool. You know, they, haven't, they haven't made a cheese flavor. That's why. Once they, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Once they make a cheese flavor, he's like, he's going to be all Just like easy cheese. Yeah. Like just... <laughs> We've infused cheese with magnesium 3 and 8. Oh my God. I'll be so excited. Yeah. Oh, I feel so good. <laughs> just all of a sudden, so relaxed. Yeah. It's funny. I got interviewed yesterday on a podcast and. The guy asked me um, how I, how we able how we were able to get a book deal with a, a big publisher. I watched, I, I watched your interview. Yeah, so uh, you know we got the uh, I have a book that's coming out uh, next month, um, and so that was his question. He's like, "How did you work? How did you get with a publisher?" And you know, I had to be honest. Yeah, no, you it, said I had no I have no like fancy answer for this. No, no, no. Here's the deal, and this is a weird. This is just a, a, a inconvenient truth of life. The more successful you become, the easier it is to become successful. And here's, I'll give you an example. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we are, you know, we've got this podcast that's really big now. We're the top fitness podcast. I never have to buy a supplement ever. Mm -hmm. I, 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 we get supplements sent to us so many, I could throw, I could throw half of them away and I'd still have more than I could take in, you know, in two or three years. Right. Why? Because we're very, you know, we're big and popular now. We got supplement privilege. So how did I get to work with a publisher? It, they contacted us. That's it. They're the ones that came to us and said, <laughs> and this is just it. This is it with success. The more successful you become, the easier it is to get breaks and to get people to trust you. Yeah. This is how credit works, right? Uh, you want to buy something and you want banks to trust you. You got to show a history of doing a really, really good job. Same thing with friends and family. You want people to help you, give you stuff. People are more likely to help you when you're proven to already be successful. Well, or I, I definitely think that's a big piece of it. Also, it's the relationships you've established along the years that have led these opportunities uh, to be presented as well. Like so, like all the different types of uh, movers and shakers that become your new circle. It's like you know they hear about you. Like it's a lot more opportunities yeah. happen because of that. Well, here's why it's like one of those like truths that's kind of like crappy. Like you know, talk about like big celebrities, right? You're you're the Rock. 
he got you know he's worth I don't know hundred million dollars, got tons of money. Yeah. He probably doesn't have to pay for dinner. Probably vacations are free. He probably tries to, and they're like, no, no, no. yeah. Companies are like, hey, come fly on our private jet for, for free and eat at our restaurant, or come, you know, here's a car because whatever. And the guy could afford to buy all this stuff. Well, it's not even that. It's also too as you get you get bankrolled, you can you can make bigger moves too that make bigger amounts of money. That's so true. like when you talk about investing and, and being able to get into things. There's there's certain things when you're at a certain level you just can't get in entry level to. So there's that advantage too. So you get all kinds of shit for free, and then the money that you're starting to stack up, you opens up new doors. This is one of the reasons why, and people need to understand this, this is very important, why when you have a, a relatively free society, the wealthy, uh, they grow their wealth faster than the people in the middle or even at the bottom. Now, in free society, statistically, this is a fact, you can look up all the statistics you want, everybody's wealth increases, everybody's quality of life from a material standpoint mm. improves. But why does the wealthy grow so much faster? Well, here's a simple example, right? If you take $10,000 and you invest it in the market and somebody else takes $100,000 and invest it exactly the same way, identical, same investment, and they both grow at 10%, percentage-wise, same growth, but the $10,000 guy, how much did he make with 10% and how much did the $100,000 guy make with 10%? It's just a larger dollar amount. Yeah. Um, and so you just, you have more money allows for more. Of well, there's, that there's more to that, that formula too, though. So I mean, uh, the millionaire next door talks about this and that's, um, and I think the stat was like 80, it was high 80% of, of millionaires and billionaires also have trained themselves to live below their means. So they also have created good behaviors that continue to feed into them oh, being for sure. more successful and making more money. For sure, where a, a lot of people get caught in the rat race. I mean, I I think uh, the, the, the stat is 80, 80 I think it's eighty eight percent. I was listening to another like a business podcast talk about this that actually live paycheck to paycheck. So a majority of people are living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. They're not living below their means, which is only making it that much harder for them to get ahead. So you add in the fact mm -hmm. of you know, all the doors that opens up for being a millionaire or billionaire, but then they also, to become a millionaire or a billionaire, there's a lot of behaviors that you had to learn, learn. on the way to there no, that, that play into your favor. No, it's true. And I hate to say this, but, you know, I have friends and family that, you know, struggle and I'll say things to them like, okay, I, I know you go to Starbucks twice a day. So you're spending $10 a day at Starbucks. That's $300 a month. You could buy coffee at the grocery store. It'll cost you 10 bucks. And so you're going to save 200 and, you know, at least 250 bucks a month or more. But then their mentality is like, oh, it's only 250 bucks. What's the big deal? And so they don't understand that this is the way that you start to kind of, you know, build yourself a little bit. And then the other thing is this. If you try to build wealth through your uh, job and your income, that's a that's a very difficult way to do it. Mm -hmm. The way people really build wealth is they have a job, they make money, but then they figure out ways to get that money to make money for them. Right. Then you start to build wealth because now it takes doesn't take any of your time to make that grow, and you continue to do that. So it's, it's a slow process, but once it builds up, yeah. it really starts to stack up okay, very quickly. So speaking of wealth, I want to hear your guys' theory on this, uh, and this is the art world. This is something I just saw recently. There was like this digital art uh, from this artist. I think it's Beeple is his name, but uh, there was a bunch of like – uh, people using um, like crypto uh, money to to basically purchase it for sixty nine million dollars. I saw this for this. Just it's just like I don't really know how to describe it other than it's just a bunch of little images that are all like sort of put together uh, in this digital uh, looking. It, it, it's nothing spectacular. I thought it was a collage of just a bunch of it's faces. It's a collage. He yeah. has like a collage of a bunch that's, of... That's he's a good sell, way to put he's it. selling it for $69 million? $69 million and He got $69 million. He got, That's what he got. He, he did get it. And, and before that, I guess the, um, the the CEO for Tron, one of those other ones, uh, you, you know, the uh, digital currency, uh, he was at like $60 million and he got like last second got outbid uh, by somebody coming in. And But but so what, what motivates somebody to to purchase this for that outrageous amount of money. I think this is just the beginning of what we've talked about before, which is we are heading in a time and there's already companies and things that are popping up like this where you can buy digital clothes, bro. There is there are people that are making a bunch of money selling digital clothes to people. You to use on like social on, media? Yeah. So oh, instead of go saying. buying a 
you know, thousand dollar Gucci jacket. Because you want to wear it to be on social media. Absolutely. Oh. And, and you're in this digital world. That's since, weird. And, and you, since you spend a majority of your time, which a lot of people are beginning to do, plugged into their phones and on the virtual platform and not really walking the street, I don't give a shit what I'm really wearing in real life. I spend most of my time on these platforms. So the digital art, digital clothes, huh. digital products are, are just going to continue to go, dude. It, it's that makes it's, a lot it's of sense. Mind blowing. It's weird the, as uh, shit yeah. to me, yeah, to see it. But yeah, like a piece of art like that. I, I mean, I guess that's how someone would display it. Is in the in the digital world only. Yeah, I yeah. guess. I, I mean, wait a minute. So I this, didn't really fully understand. I, know, I didn't how, fully understand it either, to be honest. That's why I wanted to hear your guys' speculation because it was just like I I don't know like how are they going to use it? How are they going to display it? Like what what was the motivation? Was it are they paying somebody off because they owe money? You know, is this some kind of racket? Well, you did have you had a, another interesting theory that I think. It's also a way you could potentially wash money, yeah, which it's I think a way to launder that's money. been that's been a way of laundering money forever. Is like re, like with art, anyways, and so digital art now with cryptocurrency. So I, what do you? How do you? So explain that. So be, let's say you got a bunch of money <clears throat> and you. Well, it's crypt. It's bought with crypto, so you can't. First of all, you can't track it back to who the person is, right? So somebody. So they took money. Let, okay, I get. Okay, let me let's let's walk through the steps. So they got money. They got sixty nine million dollars worth of cash from some kind of. Uh, Ill, you know, illicit behavior, selling drugs or whatever. And they're like, okay, I want to be able, I can't put this in the bank. I can't do anything with it because I haven't paid taxes on it. It's not, it's not clean. So then they take that 69 million, they buy crypto. Now they can use the crypto to buy the digital currency, or excuse me, the digital art, and then what? Now they have something valued that yeah, much? Yeah, something that's valued uh -oh. that much that they could probably sell for 10% less pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So they could flip and, it real quick? Yeah, flip pay it. Taxes yeah, or hold on to it as an asset until they want to sell it one day. Wow. Yeah. And it's not traceable and probably taxable. Wow. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. How do you take cash and buy crypto? Mm. That's right, because you'd have to put it in a bank or something to buy the crypto, wouldn't you? Question, you mean like through Coinbase? Yeah, yes, but how do you take you the cash and put it on Coinbase? Yeah. Don't yeah. you have to take it from your bank? You do. Mm -hmm. But once mm -hmm. it gets into Coinbase and then gets in by- But you have to get it there first. So right. That's their trick right there. Yeah. Right, right. Because barrier. you just can't take cash and say, hey, I'm going to convert this into crypto. <laughs> I don't believe you can. Go down to your local crypto dealer Because guy. if that's the yeah. way you could do that, what about <laughs> all these people- all cash. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not the person to ask you about this stuff. I'm not like a crypto <laughs> guy whatsoever. Yeah, um, but it, I, Adam's like the way I do it's different. No, I so <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's not how I wash money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm way more old school. You know, I have laundry oh, yeah. mats. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of quarters. Yeah. So. Yeah. Bunch of strip clubs, <laughs> banks yeah. overseas. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So yeah. no, but I, I was my point was that uh, to that is not that I know anything about that subject whatsoever. Was that Justin's theory of that it could be a way to wash money is an interesting theory, and that could be a, if my yeah, I don't theory, know how they do it. I just think that it's it smells. Yeah, my theory is that we're moving into this digital world, and that's what's going on. Is yeah, that, yeah. That, that that things? Like, I mean, if somebody is willing to pay, but it's so easy to copy because it's digital. How does it make it? How does it even hold its value? I know. You know what I'm it, saying? That, it's mind blowing. Like digital is, it's it's a perfect copy. It's not like art where in order to copy like an actual physical piece of art, it, right. it's really really it's like, difficult. Ooh, I just screen captured it. Now I have it. Yeah. It's, <laughs> uh, uh, cool. You spent sixty nine million dollars for this, and I got it for free. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. Sweet. Yeah. I'm, you know, what? I I know that our forum will come to the rescue on this, and definitely school is there. Yeah. I know. Please, somebody explain. We this have we me. have several crypto nerds in our forum. We have some drug dealers in the forum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The like, here's how the black market works. You yeah. guys. The guys are idiots. How the laundry works. Yeah, yeah it's it's a it's a we're I mean we're moving in this time, dude. It's gonna get really it's gonna get weirder for sure. Yeah, it's know? interesting. All right, speaking of weird, uh, did you guys know that there's a surgery that an approved surgery? to make people taller. Have you heard of this? What? Okay. This is a real cosmetic surgery. It's, it's You hear that, Doug? It's a pro <laughs> Yeah, I'm already signed up. <laughs> <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> you finally lead, re, 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 lead, or I'll lead eventually be 5'4". You know, Yay! Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, right. Right. Hey, yeah, don't piss Doug off. dunk on yeah. you, dude. Yeah, I kill you. Yeah. So, uh, no, this is, a, 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 this is an actual approved surgery. And to me, it's it sounds so crazy, but this is what they do. They'll take somebody who wants to be taller. They'll this is for real. They'll saw through their tibia and fibia. They'll saw through it. They'll Just add a few. Take right, them yeah, apart and add uh, metal uh, like bars or whatever. So they literally take the bones, separate them by two or three inches or an inch, 
add the metal part, then the bone grows together, then they'll do it again, then the bone goes Ugh. together to get the person this taller. That's awful. Now, the only side effect of it is you get a really long lower leg, yeah. but, um, I mean, it works. People will add a few inches to their height from doing this surgery. Well, and if Just you have, wear those stupid shoes. And know? if you have short legs, it won't look that crazy because you. Can, I mean, there's some people that have much longer legs than other people. So yeah, Michael Phelps will look normal if they do this to him. <laughs> yeah, you ever yeah. seen his, his Yeah, uh, yeah, his he's all torso. Proportions? Yeah. yeah. How crazy is that? Though? You imagine getting surgery, getting your legs sawed in half. They Just proved to this? This is a real surgery. Dude. Where, here in the States? It's in the States. Wow. Yes, We dude. have no more ethics. Where no. did you find? I haven't even heard of anyone doing this yet. Well, I don't know anybody who's done it either, but I read the article on it. Which is kind of weird. Yeah, that's really yeah, weird. Yeah, they have a and lot of weird- it's just purely cosmetic, right? There's no, no. like, yeah, justification. It's co Well, I mean, okay, look, let's be honest. Cosmetic surgery in general is weird. Yeah. A lot of it is very, very strange. I've seen people, there's this guy that used to work- no, we, do, we do a lot to attract the opposite sex, Bro, I, I have seen- This is true. You guys have probably seen the same guy. He worked out at the, at the 24 there in South San Jose, and he'd come in, and I know he's in his 60s or 70s, Jet black hair because he dyes it. Oh, I know who you're talking about. You know exactly what I'm yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. And so why right he used away. to tuck his tuck his tank top Bro, in, and, and his face is like, yeah, yeah. like he's like, oh, like he's going like five G's on his face. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's like, and he kind of walks like, hey, it's really windy outside. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, it's, there was a, there's definitely a surgeon when he ever he go. I'm sure he's had multiple multiple surgeries. The surgeon's probably you know who says to him, yeah, I'll do that, no problem. <laughs> so you talk about ethics. Yeah. Like, you know, look at Michael Jackson. Like, there was no surgeon that looked at him and was like, yeah. nah, dude, yeah. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do anything else to you. Face. Yeah, I don't want to mess this up. Yeah, so it's the whole thing is kind of weird. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. You know, I saw something that was weird. I wanted to ask you guys if it, this is true. And it's so I read somewhere. Okay, and again, fact check me. I don't know if this is true. This is totally not something that I dug very deep. I, but I figured you guys are into, especially Justin, all the ancient shit. Yeah, that some there was some ancient <laughs> cultures that used wearing masks over the society's face to, to like dehumanize them. Yes. Yeah. And then make slaves of them. Yep. yep. Is this true? I've read that. Yep, I've read that too. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Well, so wearing so people don't okay, and there's it's I, an effective way to dehumanize these interactions between uh, people. The, the face is that because they lose their identity because everybody looks correct. kind of the yes. same. It's like so, taking someone's name. Yeah. Right. Like you don't have a name. We're gonna call you one one five. Do we know? Whatever. Do we know the, the 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 culture or when and where or anything like that? Like I can't. It was. It was some ancient culture that I saw the... Uh, I, the I, I, I'm sure it was... I think it was used... I'm trying to remember. I read about this a long time ago. I think it was used in multiple places as a way to uh, to dehumanize and break down the spirit of the captives mm -hmm. that they were doing it on, and they'd make them wear masks. Mm -hmm. Human faces are such a, in, 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 such a big part of our brain is dedicated to reading yes. expressions and faces um, that it's there's a big... Like I said, it's a big part of your brain, and any... By the way... Just like your muscles. If I don't use my bicep anymore, it'll atrophy. Mm -hmm. If I don't use the parts of my brain that read expressions and faces, I start to lose the ability to read expressions and faces. By the way, you can look this up. This is real. This is why people who are in a particular society or culture, let's say you're in a very homogenous society. You live in a country where... Everybody looks the same, right? There's not a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of not a lot of different races, a lot of different people. Everybody looks the same. That's when those people will see people from other cultures or races. They will say things like, "They all look the same." Oh, I can't. It's hard for me to to tell the difference between, you know, this white person and that white person. They all look the same, or whatever. This is because their brain has yet to develop the the yeah, the, the nuances, the skill of reading different faces because they see so many people that look the same. Yeah. yeah. So when you're, and this is just a side effect. If people wear masks all the time. Then there's definitely a side effect. There's definitely effects from it. Dude, there's aside so from much information your brain is is reading off of people with their expressions, like subconsciously, that we don't even give credit. It's like to me, if you go back in the podcast a while back, like uh, before any of this even like went down, yeah. anybody's wearing masks or anything. Uh, that was always my stance. Was like anybody who wears masks, I don't trust you. And that's just that's just a psychological thing uh, where think about like anybody going into a bank and robbing a bank or. Or, you know, like like furriers, or you know, these people that are like, <laughs> you know, like secretly they they, they want to be, uh, you know, anonymous. inconspicuous. Yeah. They want to be anonymous. Uh, that's that's the thing. Like I look, what are you hiding? Yeah, is yeah. is always how my brain works. Yeah. And so now it's like like everybody is 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 all in on this thing, and it just drives me crazy. So do you guys think there's going to be unintended consequences that happen? Of course, from this? of course. Like what are, in, what are there's not there's not going to be no consequences. Of course, it's turmoil we've, over this. We've completely. 
codified uh, a, a particular behavior within our culture, a particular way that we live. So are there side effects? Of course. Trying to predict what those side effects are, we can speculate, but is there going to be? Of, look, you take anything that we do all the time or the way we live all the time and you radically change it, there's going to be a side effect. My, in my estimation, this is my guess, my guess is we're going to see much bigger side effects in children than we will in adults mm -hmm. because children's brains are so plastic. And what I mean by that is uh, a, a child's brain is constantly molding and shaping. And at a certain point, a certain age, you lose plasticity of your brain. You still, can, you still maintain a certain amount, but there's a lot that you lose. For example, if you take a, a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old and you teach them five languages, they will speak five languages without an accent, all of them perfect with the right dialect, the right sound, the right whatever. You take a 30-year-old and you teach them five languages and they can study the languages as much as they want, whatever, and they can learn them, right. but they'll always have an accent with they're, them. They're carrying in their hardwired patterns. Yes. And so with children, they're, if they're going to school, they're going outside, they're, you know, whatever, and they're not seeing lots and lots of different faces and they're just seeing mom and dad's face, brother's face, and nobody else's faces all the time. Um, and they're not, their brain is going to start to hardwire the, and they're going to lose some of this. And this is my guess. They're going to lose some of this ability. And and this is it's like social intelligence. Mm -hmm. You know, we all know that person who can't read a room. Or can, look, in extreme cases, autism is like this, right? Somebody yeah. who has a really really severe form of autism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they can't tell if you're being sarcastic. Yeah. If you're being they somebody's can't. agitated right in front of you, just based off of their body language. Body language. Yeah. We've cut out body language. Yeah. So they can't read. You, you know all the intricacies of your face. So I feel like children, we're going to see some. So yeah, but then what happens? What's the what's the domino effect of that? So the, you, my thought when you say that is that we're probably going to become even more divided and mm -hmm. and and stick in in Maybe. groups. Yeah, where where you where you're comfortable, where you recognize, where you know this is mom, this is brother, this is sister, this is my good friend. We know each other really well. Outside of that, everybody else is unfamiliar, well, right? Unfamiliar and only most of the time we connect virtually and not socially yeah. in person. Right? I see it as like the the unintended, uh, you know, consequence of this is, you know, we may be perceiving everybody with a mask on is like, oh, you're you're sickly. Oh, you have like you have a virus. Like it's it's this like negative connotation of like you're hiding. Like like you, your health is is compromised. Like and we're seeing that everywhere. Everybody's compromised. You know, and it's like you're you're portraying that negativity on everybody. Yeah. Well, see, my baby son. Who's he's he's at four months old, and you know if we're out and we're wearing masks, and I go to play with my son, and I'll make sure nobody's around me or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I notice this with I, masks. I pull it down yeah. and I look at him and make sure he can read my yeah. face because I know his brain is learning all that stuff. You imagine raising a baby, always seeing people in masks. They're gonna they're gonna be so, they're gonna lose mm. a an, an element of social intelligence. And if you keep it done long enough, permanently, no, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, Neurolinguistics, right? That I mean, that's that's a very important part of us, our, our social skills. Yeah, right? yeah. So, yeah. I, now we're, we're supposed to mention another one of our sponsors, Public Goods, and I get a lot of questions on Public Goods about what their membership looks like and how that works. So I wanted to let people know uh, on the podcast how why they're able to to charge the low prices that they that they're able to charge and how the company really works. Because I think I've had people tell me, how am I buying something at you know, 60% less than I'll buy somewhere else. Well, think, uh, I mean, and I'm sure they don't like this analogy, but I mean, it's, I think it's the easiest way for the average person because of how big the brand Costco is. It's like the, you know, direct to consumer Costco of all natural like brands. Yes. Right. Yes. So like all they cut out a lot of middlemen. It's a membership. I think it's the, the price right now is $59 a year. So it's yeah. like less than five bucks a month. Yeah. And then you get, uh, these really low price, all these household goods. And then they also value uh, the environment. They don't put chemicals in there that are known to be xenoestrogens, um, you know, all those different things. But typically, if you go to this grocery store and you're buying a product that's environmentally conscious, no xenoestrogens, uh, you're going to pay a premium for it. Yeah. But you go to a company like Public Goods and you're actually paying less yeah, than, the than you stuff. are for the cheap shit that you get yeah. at Safeway or exactly. whatever. Exactly. So that's how the company works. And then, uh, of course, through we us. St we stock our whole house now with yeah. that. I tell you what, yeah. we, I mean, I remember we used to work with uh, Thrive before and I never really used Thrive that much. Um, I use the shit out of Public Goods. I mean, it's our, our hand soap, our bars of soap, our shampoo, our... Um, 
our body wash, uh, laundry, I, uh, laundry, deter- paste, laundry yeah. detergent, toothpaste. I mean, I buy all of their stuff. Yeah, and I know that it's, you and it, I save a ton of money, dude. And then mm-hmm. with through us, you go on there, and I think they give you like a, a certain credit, so you can literally buy. You get yeah, stuff for free. Uh, Doug, do you know what the offer is that they're running right now? Because I, I know it's still fifteen dollars. You can buy fifteen dollars worth of stuff with no commitment. And that's with it. No commitment. So yeah. just get fifteen yeah. bucks of stuff for free. Yeah, try it out. Set up. Yeah. yeah, so. yeah. Hey, everybody, real quick, before we get to the question portion of today's podcast, go to mindpumpfree.com and go check out all of our free, amazing information, Pulitzer Prize winning written information. Actually, it should win a prize. It hasn't, but uh, but it should. Amazing information. Great stuff. Build a better squat, better arms, get a nicer midsection, become a better personal trainer, much more. Uh, it's at mindpumpfree.com. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. First question is from that guy, KC. How much creatine should I consume and when? I'm a 37-year-old male with 16% body fat. Oh, creatine. The greatest supplement, literally the greatest supplement. One of the ones that actually works. That exists. Uh, It works. It improves your health. It's good for cognitive function. It helps you build muscle, burn body fat. Actually might even raise testosterone, anti-inflammatory. Yes, I sold creatine, but that's because it's it's very well studied and it's a very, very good supplement for most people to take. Dosages. Okay, here's what they typically recommend, about five grams a day. I think that's a very general kind of overkill. I would say if you eat a decent amount of red meat, which already has creatine in it, um, and uh, your you know, average build, I would say you're probably okay with about three, three grams a day. Now, if you have a lot of muscle mass, you probably want to take a little more than that. If you don't eat a lot of red meat, especially if you're vegan, if you're vegan, Creatine makes a huge difference. In fact, the cognitive boost studies uh, are pretty consistent with vegans. If they take creatine, they get a pretty measurable cognitive boost from taking it. So anywhere between three to five grams a day is probably the best dose. Now, don't most, I I think almost every one I've ever seen, whether it be pill or powder, the serving size is normally five grams. Yes. And you don't see any problem with somebody taking two over if they even if they nah. eat because i'm just saying from a saving because by the way the, the amount of steak you have to eat just to get three grams of creatine is a lot it's like a pound mm-hmm. it's a lot it's yeah, a lot it's more pretty, than, it's it's pretty more pretty than that to get three grams really yeah, yeah, yeah well, I, I, how much how much creatine doug in a pound of steak if you could look that up because um, I, I think it's around you're right i think it's like two yeah, grams or yeah so the, i would only recommend if it's someone's like you eat red meat every day at least once or twice mm-hmm. then maybe you can go lower otherwise i normally just tell people five grams are they still promoting a loading phase i remember doing that when i was younger and i i remember eating an excessive Cell, amount in the beginning yeah so so was here's it cell tech the ones that did it first oh wow it's, see, there it's we go. like five days of loading yeah. uh you know it's almost like double triple the dose yeah, yeah. so so uh, i want to address that but real quick one pound of raw beef or salmon, one to two grams of creatine. Yeah, you're right, Adam. So yeah. it's not- it's That's not a lot too, by the way. You yeah, know I mean, a pound? Yeah, a pound. Yeah. <laughs> so most people, a big serving of meat is like eight ounces. So yeah. if you're, 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 you're going to be eating at least two servings yeah. of probably steak or salmon a day. I eat at least a pound uh, a day. So I'm somebody which a lot, but most people don't. Yeah. Now, back to what you're saying, Justin, the loading phase. So a lot of companies will promote what's called a loading phase, where- For the first seven days of using creatine, you take 15 to 20 grams a day, Mm -hmm. and then you back down to five grams. Now, the reason why they promote this is studies show, so here's what happens with creatine, right? You take creatine, and you start to saturate the body with with this creatine, and there's a certain period of time that it takes to, to saturate the muscles. After that, you're taking creatine just to maintain that saturation level. Loading saturates the body a little bit faster, so... Will you get that saturation faster from loading? Yes. Is it that big of a difference? Enough to waste <laughs> that much oh. creatine? Not in my opinion. It would make me sick. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, you, uh, it's just not worth it from that perspective. Now, no, to I, that point, though, you would say that it's pretty important to be consistent, though, with it when you take it daily, the, especially the beginning, right? Yes. Five grams. I always say five grams a day. It's a good, you know, anywhere between three to five grams every single day is the way to do it. Now, what about time to take it? Now, in the past... I would have said it doesn't make that big of a difference. They say post-workout. Yeah, now. studies now are showing that post-workout, you utilize a lot more mm. of it by taking it right after I feel like that's kind of common sense. Yeah. I mean, that's like it, it, yeah. it, you, when, you are, when you're when you depleted like that, like your your muscles, your cells, everything's like they're a sponge. Yeah, they're thing. all yeah. like a sponge ready to suck up any sort of nutrients yeah. or supplement you take. So here's, a, here's a little muscle bo- boosting hack. For those of you that are, that are watching or listening right now that really want to, you know, feel and see an effect from natural uh, means, try this. Post-workout, take your five grams of creatine and also consume a good four to 600 milligrams of cholesterol. So egg yolks or 
You can do organ meats or whatever. Cholesterol's got a muscle building effect. Uh, it's got a protective effect. The creatine gets absorbed by the body. And you do your body does utilize cholesterol as you're recovering or whatever. So do those two things. Try that for like a few weeks and watch what happens. Didn't you didn't you bring up a study a long time ago of uh, actually combining that with red light too? Red light, oh, okay. So right, so that, isn't that like the monster, right? Yeah. There? So red so. light therapy increases the ATP production of the mitochondria in your cells. This is why it, it that's why it works, right? So it makes sense to combine it with creatine because you're trying to boost ATP. Red light plus creatine, you should have this kind of synergistic effect. And I've experimented with it, and I love it. Next question is from B Bounks. Is high cholesterol still the demon we once thought it was, such as having high LDL, but also having high HDL? No, it was it was overstated for a long time. So here's the deal with cholesterol. Obviously, if it gets super high, you can have some problems. But if it's kind of high and all your other markers of health look good, it's probably not a, a big deal. It's one metric that you measure. Now, here's what studies show with slightly high cholesterol. You build more muscle and you're stronger. And it seems to have a protective effect in older individuals. In fact, people who live the longest tend to have relatively high cholesterol. So it's a very interesting thing that it's funny that we targeted it as a demon for so long, probably because we had some pretty effective pharmaceuticals at lowering cholesterol. So whenever we have a drug that does a good job of changing a number, we put a lot of focus on that number and cholesterol with statins, that was that well. Was explain the explain the difference of the the fluffy particles versus the other. One. I always get this backwards or messed up whenever I try and explain this. What, yes. What, so, is, what is the difference in that? Because so, there's like there's there's like bad HDL and there's good HDL, right? Yeah. So so you have your good cholesterol and your bad cholesterol, right? The good cholesterol is got a protective effect. The bad cholesterol has got more of a damaging effect. But that's a, it's an overgeneralization. If you look deeper, um, the really dense. Uh, particles of cholesterol, the ones that tend to cause damage, the real fluffy ones, uh, tend to not. So, and here's the thing with cholesterol too: it, it's oftentimes we see it real high, or we see, for example, when you're looking at arteries and you're seeing the cholesterol mm. and stuff patched up on the sides of the arteries, they blame the cholesterol. But really, it's 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 a side effect. Uh, there are doctors and scientists that believe that the cholesterol is being used as a way to protect uh, or patch up inflamed Isn't areas. There, I mean, genetic uh, components. Huge. That is, right? The majority of that, right? If, when it's problematic versus dietary cholesterol. Dude, cholesterol is so important for our health that our body makes it. And yeah. your liver and your body uh, dictate. I mean, you can increase your cholesterol intake and uh, that you're eating and your body will just make less of it. And you can eat less and your body will make more and kind of keep you at this homeostasis. So based off that theory, you could go to the doctor and the doctor could technically tell you have really high cholesterol and you actually be in a very healthy place. Is that possible? Depends how high. And you know, if we're talking like your numbers are like 300, 400, uh, you probably have some problems. If you're, cause they say anything over 200 is bad, right? But let's say you're at 220 and your ratio of HDL to LDL is really good and your blood pressure is good. Your triglycerides are good. Everything else looks good. Inflammatory markers look good. You're probably you're well, probably and what okay. if most all the HDL is the fluffy particles and and not the really dense ones? Very, it's good luck getting that test. I know that that was my next question. Yeah. Okay, say I come back, I go, and the, and I'm two twenty, right? Yeah. So I'm on on the higher end, and the doctor says that to me. Do I have the ability to ask him like, hey, are those are those more fluffy or are those yeah, more? Can dense? I get a more detailed look? Yeah, unlikely. You'd have to go to a special. I mean, they're they're not. It's not mainstream. And yet. most likely, he's going to try and put me on a statin right away, right? He is be because a statin is so easy. If you take a statin, your cholesterol goes down. Mm -hmm. Done. It's a guarantee, right? It just works. By the way, there's a there's a natural statin. If you're somebody who's dealing with highish cholesterol and it's kind of borderline, and you're a little concerned, and your doctor's a little concerned. You can try red yeast rice extract, which you could buy uh, over the counter, um, and it's a natural statin, much milder than the pharmaceutical ones, and it will lower your cholesterol. Now, I thought actually dietary cholesterol has very little to do with your HDL and LDL levels. Correct, correct. In fact, the the they're changing their stance. They're now saying that cholesterol is no longer a nutrient of concern. Uh, typically, poor cholesterol numbers are coming from uh, an inflammatory response. Diet is high in calories, high in sugar, you're not active, and then genetics. Uh, Justin hit the nail on the head. There are people who just have, you know, high, there's a condition, hypercholestemia or something, I can't, I'm not pronouncing it right, but uh, mm -hmm. it's something like that, where people make tremendous amounts of cholesterol and then they're very prone to uh, issues with their heart. 
in those cases, statins can definitely be a, a lifesaver. So now are most, are, are most doctors up to speed on this to where, or are we still have doctors that go, oh, stay away from the butter and bacon? I don't know. I wouldn't, yeah. And eggs, you know, cut those about, out. Think about the, the pharmaceutical industry in general. How much power Yeah, how much power and influence they like. So I just, I don't think new information like that is really being pushed as hard. No, look, okay, look at it this way. Uh, statins have been around now for a little while. And they very effectively lower cholesterol. And when they first came out, there was a prediction that this would just revolutionize medicine and the heart attack and heart disease rate would go through the floor. Now, here's what happened. If you look at the statistics, the survival rates from heart attacks and heart disease increased dramatically. Not from statins. It was from advances in the procedures, like putting stints in your arteries and stuff like that. The real heart disease rates are still high as hell. Statins have barely made a dent or no dent whatsoever. Now, I know there's studies that show that statins might have some benefit. There's others that show there's no benefit. There's studies that show that statins reduce cognitive function, increase right. the risk of dementia. So uh, I would say cholesterol, it maybe it's one piece of a big picture. Right. Don't just rely on that one piece because it doesn't tell you a whole lot by itself. Have they found, like, have they attributed it more towards, like, calcium deposits and, like, hardening type minerals that have contributed more it's, towards, like, heart Yeah, that's part issues. of it. That's part of it. And I'm not super versed. But I, yeah. but fr from what I understand, it's just not the the big deal that yeah. we thought it was. And I was then always if, curious well, about this, just because my my grandpa died of what they diagnosed as like high cholesterol, but like. To me, it was like it was suspect because of that. Like, I I want to know more information about like you know what they're doing now to really like uh, diagnose and assess uh, a lot of these conditions. Well, when we first started the podcast, didn't uh, the Heart American Heart Association had to come out and recant their stance on all this on cholesterol? Yes, yeah. on cholesterol, dietary cholesterol. Yeah, that was yeah. just like five six years ago. It was yeah. Right when we started the podcast, I remember that was big news. They though. used to say you know be careful how much cholesterol you consume. Now they're saying uh, the cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern. They're still you you got issues. They still have issues with saturated fat and stuff like that, which we can make arguments for as well. But cholesterol now, I think it's pretty mainstream accepted that it's not something that you need to be careful for that you consume. Now, here's a deal. Old school bodybuilders knew, and this is a legit thing. You try this out yourself. They knew when they consumed a lot of cholesterol. And remember, these are healthy, fit people. These were old school bodybuilders, so they weren't on all types of, of gear and all that stuff. They knew that when they increased their dietary cholesterol intake, they would get a boost in strength and recovery. Uh, there's studies that support this. They've done studies where they'll take groups of people. They do this with older people, I think in their 50s, and they broke them up into groups. And this group ate 200 milligrams of cholesterol a day, and then it was 400 and 800 or something like that, which is a lot, right? And the people who, the more cholesterol they consumed, the stronger that they were and the more muscle that they built. I experiment with this all the time. Oh, you guys know me. You guys have seen some of my breakfast where I'm eating eight to 10 egg yeah. yolks just for the cholesterol. When I do that, I'm stronger. I'm stronger in the gym every single time. So this is something you can play with. But yeah, as a number, it's one small piece of a bigger picture by itself. It doesn't, unless it's really, really high, it doesn't really mean much. Next question is from Team Quinn Fit. When using a food scale to track ounces of meat, should you measure it raw or cooked? You know, I I used to get this question all the time. I still do. I, it's it's I want I wanted to I picked it right because because we get it so often. I don't get this question ever. We <laughs> strange. <laughs> well, I you know I so I definitely uh, weighed and measured and, and tracked my my food uh, religiously for you know over three years like without ever missing a day. Yeah, and. I actually never got caught up in this. I never really cared if it was uh, raw. Whatever I did, I just stayed consistent with it. So if you measured it cooked, then that's how you always do it. Always did it that way. Mm -hmm. Or if I were to measure it. So there's like these camps, right? Of yeah. like, which way is the better way? Oh, after it cooks, you lose some of the the, um, the amount of calories and protein that are in mm -hmm. it. So it's not as high. And so you should do it before and not after. Or mm -hmm. after is actually what you're consuming. So you should actually do it after. It's like, there's all these camps. I'm just like, I, you're, we're talking about splitting hair shit right here. It's literally. Yeah, how much do you lose? Like you, you cook a pound of beef. Uh, versus yeah, you don't. don't lose that much. Yeah, and again, it doesn't really matter if that's how you always track. Mm -hmm. If you're always tracking cooked food, then you should stick with that. Yeah, because then you're measuring that with your results and with your fat body fat. But then it doesn't matter. Yeah, but so right. people want to know this because this is what happened, and this is the part that I don't like. And I we are we have a free macro calculator that people can go online and use. So so we, what mapsmacro.com right. So, but here's why I don't like tools like that is because. Everyone gets so hung up on the number that that thing kicks out for you. That thing doesn't know you. Yeah. It doesn't know your behaviors. And even with, if you input it all of it, and ours is great. It's very, it's really accurate. But it's still generic. 
and your and your day to day changes. So you got to figure all that stuff out anyway. So just because my macro calculator tells you you need X calories and X protein, that that's not like you can't follow that to a T. That's a good guideline for you to where to start. And then from there, you have to kind of modify and figure out like where is your kind of homeostasis. And so wherever you're measuring, I would just stay consistent. I did it cooked because, you know, nasty raw food messing with it <laughs> on, on a scale. scale and stuff. Like, no, <laughs> like it just was easier after I was done cooking to throw it in there and then weigh it and measure it. Yeah, well, I so I, feel, I, I think it's if you really want to get crazy and meticulous, uh, whatever you're using, that'll give you the number. So let's say you go on like Fat Secret or whatever. I think you can put in... Raw or cooked. Raw chicken. You can put one raw pound. or cooked on it. Right. So just use that. It'll tell you whatever you're measuring. And then just be consistent. And I think the best part of what you're saying, Adam, is pay attention to your body. It's like, you know, oh, why am I not getting leaner? I know I'm consuming only 1,600 calories. That's a deficit. Who cares? You're not getting leaner. It means it's too much for you. Drop it down. Yeah. But being consistent is going to allow you to do that. Right. Next question is from Mo Strength Gains. Lots of people have older family members they care for. If you were to recommend a few movements that would help them build some strength, what would they be? I know Sal has worked with lots of older clients, so maybe this one's for him. Yeah. Oh, go ahead and sit this out, Justin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you guys have worked with a lot of older clients. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. I think I, you, I stick with the young ones. Yeah, yeah, no, I think as you talk that you really liked it so much yeah. that people just assume It's just because I, I, at one point, my studio, uh, I mean, we were next to a hospital and I trained a lot of doctors, and then the doctors started referring me a mm -hmm. lot of their patients, and all their patients were in that older older age category, and I enjoy it. But all right, here's one of the best exercises uh, you could do with. First off, uh, no, never overestimate uh, somebody in, in an older age group. Never overestimate the recovery ability. The, the, the lightest, smallest activity that's outside of what they're used to will cause an effect in their body, will cause change. You overdo it, and they'll get sore and injured very easily. So, and this I, I learned very quickly. It's like, oh, let's do yeah. some standing lunges. And then they didn't show up for the next session because they couldn't move. Yeah, you got to really simplify it. Yes. Yeah, here's the best exercise, okay? Sit down, stand up. Mm -hmm. It's a very basic, it's a squat, but mm -hmm. you're sitting down. So you have something to aim for. You could stick your hips back and it doesn't require as much control and stability. I'd have my, my older clients reach forward with their hands, stand in front of a chair or a bench. And if the bench was too low, I'd put like a stack pads on it or whatever and slowly progress them to go, to go lower. And they would just sit down. The goal was not to plop down. It was to softly sit down, stop for a second, get themselves you know gathered and then stand back up. And that was one of the staple exercises I did. And it's so functional because they do that. They do that, you know, throughout the day. Yeah, I, I, exactly. Like you have to start like at that level and, and really assess like where their strength level is first. Like that would probably be like one of the first things to get them to sit in a chair. But also I, I guess I could just test this on like everybody actually, when I would, uh, you know, get a new client, I would, I would place them on the ground yes. and on their back and I would see, okay, I want to just first see how you get up off of the ground. And that's a very, very straightforward, very simple. Like I'm not even intervening or, or cueing them, coaching, nothing. I want to see how they do it. And then I come in and I kind of show them like the way that I want them to do. It. And also like, you know, and then we turn that into an exercise and uh, it, it's just one of those things. It's the life function. Like if you're on the ground, you need to know, you need to have the strength to be able to get up and do that properly with good mechanics. You have no idea just how, I, so I worked with uh, a, an amazing physical therapist that I learned a lot from. She actually rented space in my facility and she was, one of her specialties was working with uh, advanced age population. And she did a lot of that, Justin. Mm -hmm. And why did she do it? Well, first off, there's a, you're using a lot of muscle. So just going, getting on the floor and standing up is an exercise by itself. Yeah. I mean, you could turn it into a Turkish getup if you want to get real advanced. Yeah, you can, but you don't have to necessarily. No, but the reason why she did it is because she's like, this is a skill that they're going to need. And if they lose this skill, it makes them very vulnerable to There's the statistics problem. on that. Yep, yes. There's statistics on uh, on somebody who can get up off the ground versus somebody who can't, like how long they live. The risk of death yeah, goes up through the roof. Yeah, dramatically. And the amount of how much their longevity is like increased by like two decades yep. by, by being able to do that. I'm right with you, Justin. That's exactly... Now, what Sal said... Sometimes is like the 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 regression, right? That's, oh yeah, because like, yeah. there's some clients that they can't I, even get off the ground. No, yeah, totally. they, and you know that you can tell by the way they walk and they move that they have a hard time sitting down in the chair in front of you to sign up for their training. Like yeah. you know, like okay, I'm not gonna put this person on the ground because we could be here for an hour trying mm -hmm. to get them out of the ground. I have to lift them up. Yeah, off have to the lift floor. them up. So. 100% what Sal said is is a great regression. And I, many clients, I train, bring the little plastic chair out to the, the mm -hmm. weight room floor and we would stand up, sit down. And, and even clients where I actually had to assist them, I'd have them hold on 
onto my index fingers yeah. while they and I'd have them slow down, not just plop down. I right. want I want you to slow. I would do that too with the TRX so they could hold on to something yes. and kind of just like slowly descend. Yeah. But I I would always work towards can we get up off the ground? And then the progression to that is actually can you get up off the ground with no hands? Oh yeah. yeah. So that is a, is actually I know a lot of yep. 30 year olds that yes, can do that. Yes. It is. That that's a skill that I always go back to myself to make sure that I don't that it doesn't get too difficult. If mm -hmm. I ever find myself like challenged personally to do that, I know there's mobility work that I need that I'm neglecting and it always reminds me to get back to that. Yep. So I would love to take a client at an advanced age, start them on the ground just like Justin, see how they get up without me coaching or telling cuz the other thing too that tells you a lot about their discrepancies too, like on what mm -hmm. the, what side they naturally gravitate right. towards, yep. because they'll go to the side that's more dominant, and then they'll they'll avoid the side they're weaker and they can't support themselves on. So it tells you a little bit about their movement patterns already. And then the goal would be: Can we do this without using your hands? And then, or can we progress it to like yeah. a Turkish get up? Yeah. The three most valuable exercises that I did with older populations, and again, I'm speaking generally because on the I, I, on an individual basis, there's always big you know, differences. But generally speaking, it was sit down and stand up on a bench or a chair. It was some kind of a row with a band or a yes. cable, just focusing on pulling the shoulders back and dropping them because that forward shoulder gets really, really bad as people get older. And then the other one was just reaching up. It was no oh, yeah. weight. Oh, yeah. okay. It was no weight. It was, and we would do it sitting first. We'd sit, I'd stand behind them so that I could get them to engage their core and not yes. have to arch so much. And I'd say, okay, stick your arm up as far as you can. And they would always stop like, you know, right here or whatever. And then I'd have them hold onto a stick and I'd pull their arms up a little bit. And then I'd say, okay, now hold them up here and then let go of the stick and see if you could support yourself. No weight, but that would make such a huge impact. And again, yes. here's the idea. The view is, Look at the skills that they need to be independent, which include sitting down, standing up, getting up off the floor, maintaining good posture, and reaching up above and their heads so they can grab their things. Arm over. Yeah. That's it. Those three, those right there are, are very functional, like necessary skills to remain independent. Just train those. You don't need a lot of weight. And now, if they get good at them, then you can start to add weight. But I had clients that that was all we did. I mean, we just did those yeah. things and we took our time and then and it, and it was really, really impactful. And then one more thing. This one actually I'm doing with my grandmother right now to improve her proprioceptive ability is- Balance uh, on one leg. No, no. She can't even, she barely can stand on two. <laughs> is, is, is I would have her, I have her sit on a chair and I take a balloon and it's just blown up with air, no helium or whatever. And I pop it to her and her job is to pop it back to me with her hands. And it's just to improve hand-eye coordination and proprioception. Sounds silly, um, but it's actually a very standard exercise that you do, rehab exercise that you would see. No, that's a, that's a great one. And it, you did, this question, by the way, too, we're like, we are definitely, I, I noticed we're kind of bouncing around as far as like envisioning like where this level this yes. person is. Mm -hmm. Because I, I would love, if this person could stand on one leg or, or that's cha just challenging, that. that's a great exercise. Yeah, just yeah. balance. Yeah, getting someone to stand on one leg and balance like that is is really good for so, a client, if they can do that, right? Yeah. Like you said, you're in your case, she can't even hardly stand on two, so she's not ready for that. But that would I had be a, some old clients. That would be a great that would be a, <laughs> yeah. a great goal is to be able to do that. Absolutely. Look, um, if you want to get some great free information from Mind Pump, we have a ton of free guides at mindpumpfree.com. Go check them out. We wrote them ourselves, so they're really, really good. You can also find all of us on social media. Come follow us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. It's not because we think cardio is bad. It's not because we don't understand the benefits of it. It's because we know that 90% of the majority of people that we train, it's not ideal for them for the situation they're currently in. Yes. Mm -hmm. So cardiovascular activity does have some health benefits, but if you're the like most of the clients we worked with, and let's say you're a woman in your 40s and you want to 